Hello there. My name is Philippe Salvador. I'm a, I'm a professor at State University of Rio de Janeiro. I work mostly with young people, but also with, with children. And I'm here today to talk with Lucia Rabelo de Castro. And we will talk about uh, the post-colonial or the colonial theories and its importance in the study of children. Hello, Lucia. Hope you're doing well. Hello, Felipe. Nice to see you here. Um, and uh, I am Lucia Rabelo de Castro. I am at um, uh, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. I am a professor of childhood and youth. And I do research with children and also with young people, uh, mostly using uh, the colonial theories, which is the sort of uh, theme that um, we are going to talk uh, today. So thank you, Felipe. So Lucia, I'm going to ask you a few questions and I will start. Uh, I like to ask you first, how did the colonial fields can be a resource to critic existing research on children and childhood? Yes, that's uh, a good question, Felipe. Um, decolonial theories help us to note uh, two relevant aspects in this regard. Uh, first, uh, critique by whom? Uh, since critique can be understood as uh, being located uh, geopolitically, and this means that it can be enunciated from very different positions and world locations, uh, which makes some critiques worthier considering than others on account of their location. And the second point is why to critique? That is, what, uh, what are the gaps and the, the insufficiencies in childhood theories that uh, need critique and need to be uh, looked uh, in a different way? Uh, and uh, the sort of, uh, we need to go beyond uh, the existing theories. Taking the first point to crit critique by whom? This has to do with pro problematizing one's own location as a researcher in this geopolitical uh, production or and distri distribution of childhood knowledge. Uh, I am a southern researcher, as you know, Felipe. I, I was born in Brazil. I do research in Brazil. I, I live here. Uh, However, child, childhood theories, as you know, are mostly produced by Northern scholars. And we, as Southern scholars, we are rather consumers of theories and concepts in childhood theories, rather than producers. But uh, I think we should problematize this fact. And decolonial theories help us to articulate the uh, emergence of scientific uh, endeavors with colonization back in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries to this day. Uh, so we as Latin Americans and Brazilians, we were part of this colonized world. And to this day, part of this global coloniality system, being a subordinate position in this international division of academic labor. Therefore, I'm, I, I see that the, the geopolitical structure of scientific knowledge production conditions academic inequalities 
where the global north stands as the authoritative enunciation center concerning the agenda of childhood research, as well as what counts as valid concepts, valid knowledge, and so on. Uh, this is not new. This has been affirmed by different scholars in different ways. Uh, so there is epistemic dominance in academic interactions that from the start bestow narrative positions of privilege on some researchers, those of the global north. And uh, we can uh, think, for instance, that uh, some concepts like those of uh, agency or development that are used in childhood uh, studies, uh, which can be seen as sort of universal or universalized. Uh, uh, this, the fact that they, are, that they are universalized can be regarded as effects of the hegemonization of the field by virtue of the academic position of some narrative uh, now, uh, some positions of privilege, narrative positions of privilege in the production of knowledge. And yet, I, I think, for instance, of another point that further complicates is the fact that in Latin America, especially in Brazil, uh, uh, it has been uh, said by many scholars that uh, metropolitan ideas have an extreme ease to become dominant. We as scholars, we are prone, prone to a disposition of becoming other, especially the superior academic other. But in a way, we have already been othered since colonization constitutes itself a process of producing inferior others. So as Southern researchers, our minds have become in a way captive, uh, or as the Benin philosopher Hontongi has said, we suffer from extraversion, which is the condition of exteriorizing the search for knowledge. And this leads irrevocably to a sort of impoverishment of local knowledge, or at least the search for, for local knowledge. By and large, I think the colonial theories have drawn attention to the fact, first of all, that available childhood knowledge, the dominant theories of the field, have a certain location as they are locus of production. And this has a profound impact on what these theories can offer as uh, understanding uh, the, uh, the lives of childhoods. And uh, this is uh, an important issue. And this links with your second point, point, right, on why to critic. Yes, Felipe, I think, I think you were right, because uh, we as thousands researchers, we must make the effort to de-link, as the colonial theories, theorists put it, that is, the, the, uh, we, we must think in alternative, we must try to think in insurgent ways and problematize our condition of subalternative in the International Division of Academic Labor. This is not an easy task. It requires a lot of subject, subjective deconstruction and reconstruction uh, in order to think otherwise. But uh, let me remark that an, in, an important element in this process must be the refusal 
And uh, this implies a certain mode of uh, rebelliousness and indignation in relation to the academic status quo. In this sense, I think uh, uh, with them, uh, there must be a sort of uh, a political element. Uh, uh, this is a political movement of resisting that can be at times much easier when, for instance, it's easier to adapt, to conform, and uh, just to follow what uh, is already established knowledge, what is already established uh, legitimated knowledge. And uh, uh, the alternatives are rather more difficult, I would say. And what does this refusal will lead us to? I think this refusal should ideally lead to possibilities of theory construction in childhood studies from the South and by Southern scholars. And this would certainly complexify the way of thinking and imagine, imagining uh, in childhood studies. I know this is quite difficult for many reasons. And there are reasons that are related to our own internal, internal ways of doing research. And when, when I mean internal ways, I mean uh, the ways that in our own countries, uh, the ways, the institu institutionalized ways of doing research, but there are also reasons that are related to, again, this geopolitical structure of domination in scientific production. Uh, some of these uh, internal reasons I've, I've already mentioned, uh, for instance, the captive mind, the extraversion syndrome, um, uh, which are sort of uh, impediments, obstacles to theorizing. Uh, but there are others, for instance, uh, the engulfment of childhood researchers' motivations and agenda by social problems. Here we face a sort of in inundation of childhood problems, like, for instance, child abuse, uh, violence against children, child labor, precariousness of scholarization, a whole gamut of enormous problems that seem to uh, sort of overtake our agenda, our research agenda, as if we had the responsibility to provide the very immediate answers to these societal problems, to, the, to these problems uh, that children face. But I think that uh, to think and to produce theories, we have to step back a little from the heat of these problems and from the immediacy of these problems in order to broaden our views and to be able to theorize and to theorize from the standpoint of the self. And Lucia, can you think of any examples on how we could do that? Uh, well, yes. Uh, uh, for instance, um, uh, we can think, for instance, uh, uh, of some social problems. Let's take uh, uh, poverty, for instance. Uh, and for a long time, childhood studies have worked with this concept, poor countries, poor families, poor children, in a sort of very essentialist way, in the sense of using as parameters of poverty, whatever deviations there are from an absolute standard of living, which is often that of northern industrialized countries. Thereby, uh, poverty loses, uh, as a concept, 
it loses its relational quality. That is the fact that it's always about comparisons. And comparisons depend on whom we are comparing with and what's the issue which is relevant to compare. Uh, I, I take uh, a, a testimony to bring here, for instance, uh, uh, a testimony from a woman that I came across doing research. And this woman, she lived in a dumping ground. And she said to me uh, that she was not poor at all because she had everything she needed. And that's it. So what I'm pointing at is that we as thousand researchers, we should problematize the concepts that we inherit and also the research agenda that comes together with those concepts. Uh, in the case of poverty, we should be more vigilant and critical as we deploy the terms poor children or poor families, as we seem to ascribe to them an intrinsic uh, condition of being vulnerable, being negative and being inferior sometimes. And uh, this can lead to a stigmatization because we are also doing a sort of reduction, a sort of reductionism, uh, because we are taking these children and these families as just poor, uh, as if this were the whole picture about these people. So we need to put, put into question these concepts and theories and not be overcome by the moral pressure to provide answers to problems, social problems, so that we can be able to respond with more uh, theoretical uh, uh, robustness and uh, uh, with uh, uh, theoretical alternatives to our social problems. And Lucia, what about the difficult to theorize from the South, taking into account the geopolitical structure of scientific domination? In the first place, um, we must think about our universities. Um, the university that we inhabit must be put into question as an institution that is regulated by international, and this means northern, parameters. So what counts, for instance, as good knowledge, how and where it should be disseminated, the uh, prevalence uh, of English as our academic exchange, and so on. Uh, our university system in the South is completely dominated by imperial modes of production, dissemination, circulation, and evaluation of knowledge. Uh, as many schol scholars have affirmed, the state of under development of some countries serves the surplus accumulation and overdevelopment of others. Thus, poverty is also exported. Um, for instance, when southern countries are ripped off their minerals, their water, their land, when uh, international commerce laws and bills are unfair, when the dollar uh, is maintained as the basic and the sole index of uh, international exchanges in the whole world. And what I mean is that 
to theorize from the South, we need to include and come to grips with this worldwide scale of problems in order that we can think differently about childhoods and children. Uh, if we don't contextualize poverty, for instance, or violence also in these structurally global terms, we won't be able to look afresh uh, at our own childhoods, children and their problems. And we, we won't be able to theorize from the South. And Lucia, what would you say about the relevance of the colonial theories for children themselves? What are the assets that the colonial analysis offer for, for, for children? Yes, that's a, a good question, Felipe. Uh, it's always a question that um, make us, makes us think and uh, reflect and think again. Uh, because it's, uh, it's not a, a, a task that uh, has ended in a way. Uh, I've written a chapter in a, for a forthcoming book, a forthcoming collection, uh, a Bloomsbury Handbook of Childhood, Theor Childhood Theories, that, uh, uh, which was uh, edited by John Wells, Karen, uh, John, John Wall, Karen uh, Well, and Sada Balgopal. Uh, and in this chapter, I explore this aspect more, more fully. Um, I analyze, for instance, two instances of childhoods from a decolonial perspective. Uh, the childhood of the Zapatista movement in Mexico and the childhood, childhood of the movement of rural landless workers in Brazil, the MST. And more, more schematically here, uh, what I argue is that the decolonial lens allows us to construct these childhoods as alternative child, child ontologies and re relationalities, which are not indebted to a, a normal or mainstream way of being a child. And the notion of peripherized and exoticized childhoods, which are also, uh, which are often seen as victims of precarious symbolic and material conditions of existence is questioned. In both these movements, the, the social processes of transmission of knowledge and political struggle, they are intertwined. Uh, and intertwined in, in childhood. Being a child means that uh, uh, you are uh, automatically uh, uh, located in the political struggle of these communities. So this is very important because children take part uh, in these political struggles. They are subjectivized uh, as children, as also political agencies. And uh, uh, quite differently from other childhoods, uh, uh, these subjectivation processes do, do not conform individualized child subjectivities that, uh, for instance, rights holders on their own rights, but rather they, they are collective subjectivities that are called for to take part in public and political issues of their context, both in the Zapatista 
and the in the MST uh, movement. Therefore, therefore, what I argue is that uh, these childs, uh, childhoods stand as an avant la lettre political posi positionality who are questioning the present capitalistic order and taking part in the production of counter narratives of future societies. And for what I mean as avant la lettre political position, positionality is that uh, uh, these childhoods, they are sort of precursors of movements that we see in northern countries where children uh, take part in uh, protests and struggles for climate change, for climate security, uh, uh, a political conscientization of uh, the issues of climate, for instance. Uh, what I argue is that MST and Zapatista children, much before and in a much uh, uh, sort of complete and integrated way, they stand as political agents in their communities. Uh, the, the process of knowing oneself as a childhood, as a child, is uh, part of uh, is 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 embedded. Sorry, is embedded in the process of uh, standing as part of struggle for land, for uh, freedom, and uh, all the the values that the Zapatista and the MST movements struggle for. So, Lucia, now we're coming to the end of this conversation. And I will ask my final question, that is, how do you see the prospects of doing childhood research in the South from a decolonial perspective? I think this is an enterprise that, uh, in a way, lies ahead. Uh, it's beginning. It's, um, it's a horizon <laughs> before uh, uh, ahead of us. Um, we childhood researchers in the South, we must still construct more solid and more collaborative networks to do this. So far, we have worked on a very individualized basis and always quite eager to establish our academic links with our Northern colleagues only. We must sort of enlarge the circuit of academic ex exchanges in the field of childhood among Latin American researchers ourselves, uh, between Latin American researchers and African scholars and researchers. And I think this must be a task that is undertaken collectively. Uh, once we aim at understanding our social realities with theoretical lenses that are capable in the long run to contribute uh, to sort of improving the conditions of the children in these regions. Uh, so in a way, uh, to reimagine childhood studies from the South, uh, we need to also reimagine ourselves as researchers and also reimagine uh, our universities, our, the way we inhabit our university, universities, how we proceed do, do, doing research, and uh, also 
we need to reimagine the acad academic bonds that we would like to cultivate among ourselves. So this is really a big task. Well, Lucia, thanks a lot for the interview. Um... Okay, Felipe, thank you very much. For, thank you for being here, for conducting such a good conversation. And uh, we'll meet. Sure. We sure will. <laughs>